please start with your name and your current band and maybe give me some background on okay. other bands you've been in. My name is Ben Kenny. I'm 41 years old. I play bass for the band Incubus. Um, I've been doing that since 2003. Before that, I played guitar for The Roots from Philadelphia. For uh, I did that from about 2000, 2001 to 2003, although I met the guys much earlier. Before that, I played in every band I could play in, every band that would hire me uh, in the regional Philly area. And I played mostly bass, but a lot of guitar, a little bit of drums. And then before that, I played in a group called Super Grub that was from the Jersey Shore with a couple of really awesome dudes. And that was pretty much, uh, well, I had another, I had other bands before that and things that happened before that. It all started with a band called Race Car yeah. in, in, uh, in high school. And we were really good and had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and uh, it all kind of leads to here. But there's lots of bands. There's, yeah. there's, there's moments. I was in one band for a month and uh, rehearsed with them every day and took a press photo and got fired a week before tour. <laughs> I, uh, I, I filled in for people. I've played, uh, I've played drums. I played drums a couple years ago for a huge pop act, just filling in. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done a lot of weird, different stuff, but the kind of the, the core of it is, if you'll have me, yeah, I'll show up. Right. I'll try to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just to keep the engine running and. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's something. It's one of the few things I I feel like I know how to do well enough to just shut up and do it. Yeah. Tell me about um, rock. How'd you get into rock music? Like, what were you, were you exposed to it at an early age? Was it something that you were just like, wait a minute, that's different? Like, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't. The, early on in my house, my, my dad had every radio station. There was a radio in the kitchen, there's a radio in the living room, there's a radio in the garage, and even the radios in the cars outside, every Sunday he'd turn them all on and they would all be tuned to WBGO 88.3, Jazz 88 in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, 201-643-4300 was the number. <laughs> I remember the phone number because of how many Sundays I spent listening to Jazz 88. So really in the house, the only music that came from my parents was jazz from my, from my father. My mom, uh, she had, she didn't, she hated the Beatles because she had a bad time in high school. And when she was in high school, the Beatles were, that was it. It was like, which Beatles your favorite? You know, which one yeah. that shares your Zodiac sign, whatever it is, you know? Right. So there was like, a, a, so classic rock was absent in my house. Mm -hmm. But I have uh, two older brothers, and when they were in elementary school, I remember uh, like U2 was all the rage, and Duran Duran, and they were just getting music that their friends were passing around on cassette. Mm -hmm. So grateful that cassettes ever existed. Yeah. Um, and I was waiting for them to go out so I could steal their tapes. <laughs> and I, I remember, uh, I remember a lot of Men at Work, a lot of Duran Duran, a lot of U2, and those were kind of three rock groups that, that early on I heard things that sounded a little bit beyond. And we used to, and we used to listen to the radio, and we used to watch MTV. But the, I connected with those bands kind of quick. Yeah. And like at like ten years old. Yeah. Did you did you see like photos of them like seeing? You know, it's like you know, all all of a sudden you, you're looking at the Beatles. You see you two. You know, these guys are from Ireland. These guys are from England. And then you know, maybe you saw musicians that look like you. You know. Um, like maybe George, you know, and, and, and you got to fast forward a few years too, you know, um, seeing black musicians or. Uh, well, there was there was a there was a divide actually. Mm -hmm. I I remember we we also listened to a lot of like uh, a lot of I, I guess I don't even know what you would call it, like Gap Band mm -hmm. and and Funkadelic and. 
a lot of prints. Yeah. Michael Jackson, I always thought Michael Jackson was a little corny. <laughs> always was like, I don't know, there's something <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah. Um, even though you could dance to it. But, I mean, we, we kind of, everything was, was on the table. And I didn't, there was a, a clear defining moment when I experienced the, the holy shit. I'm like these guys, mm -hmm. and because uh, that didn't happen up uh, up until it, it was all all throughout the '80s and MTV era and watching bands on TV and stuff. The only difference that I really thought was that I can't have hair like that. Yeah, you know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. man, I have to get a perm or something. But other than that, yeah. I just my hair is too too tight for that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was the only thing. Yeah. Because, because the way my family treated me, uh, the way that my family treated me and the way that my, my immediate environment treated me, it, there was no, like, I wasn't set aside or, or, or downgraded or anything weird. I, like, I thought I could do anything. Mm -hmm. I thought I could be anything, you know. I, I felt like anything was possible, so I didn't really see that. I wasn't aware that the barrier existed. And I wasn't, and I was finding out probably subconsciously uh, as as I got a little bit older and the, the 80s started winding down I was getting into hair metal bands uh -huh. and I remember seeing all these bands and they had you know they had the look and they had the whole thing and I, I loved it because I love I love guitar and, and a lot of it was centered around guitar mm -hmm. so I, I love the music and I think I I think Deep down inside, it, I might have been realizing that there, something was splitting because there was a moment, and it was when I was in eighth grade, that my friend Marin had handed me a tape. You're gonna love this. Mm -hmm. And I took the tape, and I was like, okay, whatever. Went straight to the Walkman. I was like, whoa, yeah. it's crazy sounds. What the hell is this? It's so amazing. Something's different about these guys. There's something that that all those other bands don't have. And and I just I filed it as that and kind of kept it as that until I was at the record store, and I'm flipping through uh, the posters. Remember how the record stores would have yeah. the big racks with the posters, yep. <laughs> and you'd be like, Ugh. flip through. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Oh, damn, she's getting it going. And then I see, I open it up, and then, and and my record store was so cool. They actually had this poster, yeah. but there they are, and it, it was Bad Brains, and. It all like it was as if lightning bolts had hit everything in my head at once, and a whole thing just lit up. And I was like, "They're fucking black." Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it was it was validating, and it was uh, and it just made it that much cooler. Yeah. It was like holy shit, man. At that point, at that point, I mean, is that what kind of drove you straight to it? It's like, okay, I know I can do it now, you know, and. Uh, you know, like getting seeing that on. Did you ever get to see them live? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me about that. I mean, they in those days when they set foot on stage, there was nothing better. There's yeah. nothing you could. No band could play like that. Mm -hmm. Not the only band I ever seen that ever came close to being able to move air like the Bad Brains is uh, Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. Other than that. There's no band where there's just four dudes and you are getting hit with dudes that can play, do play, and, and have a fire inside of them that you can't fake. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember seeing Tom Morello on stage and I, you know, stole a couple of his moves, you know, at foot stomp. And it's like, <laughs> all right, you know, now I see how it's done. Who's doing it? And know that it's possible. So, okay. You're at the Bad Brain show, mm -hmm. whatever club it is, maybe Fast CD, Lane. Fast Lane. Yeah. And you look around in the crowd, how many other black kids were there? Well, this was in Jersey. Yeah. So Jersey is kind of like New York's it's like it's like New York's neighbor runoff whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty pretty diverse there. And yeah. the scene that I grew up in uh, the the hardcore punk scene in New Jersey was pretty thoroughly integrated when it came to hardcore mm -hmm. and that facet of because hardcore overlapped with metal mm -hmm. which overlapped with, uh, with and hardcore also overlapped with punk rock straight up punk rock and 
on the outskirts of those scenes, things got kind of monochromatic, yeah. so to speak. Mm -hmm. But in the hardcore thing, it was really, it was everybody's fight. It yeah, seemed, right. That's what it felt like. Right. So at that show, there were, I remember seeing dudes that looked like older versions of me. Uh -huh. And thinking, yeah, I'm probably going to look like that guy in 10 yeah, years. Yeah. And, and it, was, it, was, it was wide open, you know, Bad Brain mm -hmm. show on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, talking to Donald, actually, um, he was saying that by the time Sinister Dane made it out east and played CBGBs and met Corey, Glover, Vern, and all those guys, he's and and Fishbone, you know, mm. that those dudes, including Bad Brains, like had already kicked that door down for them, so they didn't really run into a whole lot of, you know. I bet though. I mean, I wasn't there, but mm. I bet. Those guys went through stuff that we can't even we can't even begin to imagine. Especially like Living Color, because they yeah. were unapologetic when they 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 came out guns blazing and actually caught MTV's attention yeah. for a second. Mm -hmm. And I I think that I man I can only imagine the burden. Yeah. You know, and then it's like then they're they're making the best music they can make, mm -hmm. and they're also being a band, which is like. The most unforgiving marriage that you can have yeah. with other people, and all that pressure, and then it's like, oh, but you're the the black band, right? Oh, Living yeah. Color, what band is that? I don't know. It's the black one. Oh, yeah. oh I get it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're special. Yeah. Or Not, like Fishbone. What do we do with these guys? You know, like yeah. how do we market them? Yeah. I I I know Bad Brains had to go through the ringer because there were still kids who pretended they were Nazis and wanted to be Nazis when they were out touring. Uh -huh. So, you know, they ran headfirst into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, Living Color was on a different scale. That was like, that was uh, in everyone's living room. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine the hate mail that they got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine, them, imagine the hate would, mail yeah. they would get if they came out now. If now, right, yeah. exactly. Go so, back to Africa from New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't. Never been there. <laughs>Tell me about when you first started touring. So you grew up in Jersey. Yeah. And you you only you only went to um, California, I guess what, maybe fifteen years ago? Yeah, yeah, to live. I'd gone out there a little bit earlier, like with some of the bands that I was playing with, but mm -hmm. I the, the first time I got my mail sent there was in two thousand three. Yeah. So did you do any touring from and, and what I'm what I'm leading to is like, you know, Growing up in the Midwest, like I did, you know, you you get a lot of, I get, you know, like that story I told you before, I mean, walking through the parking lot and yeah. somebody sneezing whatever at me. Um, so in Jersey, like, you did see a lot of diversity, you know, New York side, things like that. Tell me about, like, the first time you went across the country. Now, whether it was moving or touring, like, how were the reactions? Oh, you know, I, what did you run into? Early on, well... We used to play with with my band Supergrub. Mm -hmm. We used to go and play in Pennsylvania all the time, mm -hmm. and we would go and outside of Philadelphia, we would go into like the Poconos and up in northeast Pennsylvania and a little bit west of there. And uh, Pennsylvania has got us a very specific identity as far as race culture is concerned and it's not one that you think of you think of Pennsylvania it's like oh Philly well you, you don't because I mean right. it, it, but people in California mm -hmm. even people in New Jersey who don't have any business in Pennsylvania they're just like oh Pennsylvania is, is such a sweet place it's like <laughs> it, can, it can be but yeah. there can also be some really nasty nasty old world thinking there yeah. uh, and that, that would shocked the hell out of me because um, we would go and we would be playing these put together punk rock shows mm -hmm. you know where they would find a place they could rent for yeah. 50 bucks that DIY scene yeah anywhere that's got you can hold 20, 30, 50 people find a, yeah. find a friend with a PA system mm -hmm. borrow some mics and then invite everybody down yeah and that was the circuit that we played in and uh, we, we play in these VFWs and these Moose Lodges and all these places 
where the people who whose place it was were a, they were from a different culture they weren't yeah. uh, they were kind of like I mean they weren't my people I yeah. say that <laughs> you yeah. know they weren't like they didn't look like my uncles they didn't uh, I don't I'm not sure I'm not sure yeah but uh I do remember going into some of these places and going in early, loading in gear, and there being some like crotchety World War Two vet looking dudes. Yeah. And and it's like the the, the thing we touched on before, where you can, you can just feel it, mm-hmm. the presence of it, you know, it's like sideways looks and reluctancy to say hello, yeah. and uh, taking a little bit extra to answer your questions. Hey, can I can I park my car out front? So I'm staring at you. Yeah. And it, it didn't. It also didn't help though that I was, you know, however young and mm-hmm. dreadlocked, and probably walked in without a shirt on. Right. <laughs> but, well, he just came out of the jungle. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. But but whether it helped or not, there was a vibe in some of those places. There was a vibe there that you knew, and you and. I I just wanted to I just wanted to play the damn show. Yeah. I just wanted that, and so I knew to tread lightly and to thank you, sir. Right. Thanks. Thanks for taking a whole minute and forty five seconds to say no. <laughs> Much obliged. Could have just saved us a whole lot of time. You know, just, say what you want to say. That, that that was one thing that was kind of present. Just a little, a whole bunch of little like, well, I ain't gonna make this easy for you, boy. <laughs> Tell tell me about like maybe their experiences. Did you did you ever find any energy that they felt weird? You know, maybe either had to defend you or like I, protect you or. I there there was a moment where there was a moment where I was in a band called Standpoint, and I I had joined the band a little bit later, and when I had joined the band. Uh, the founder of the band is a drummer, Steve, and his brother Scott played bass, and they are both Korean Americans. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a young girl, Riley, who sang. So we already were a little off to the side, mm-hmm. but uh, they were from that scene in New Jersey that I came from. But they had managed to, before I was even in the band, they had managed to kind of spread out to what was the beginnings of the emo scene on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, not the, well, the beginnings, but really like DC with like uh, Rites of Spring and yeah. that whole stuff, but but I'm talking about like in the 90s, the yeah. second wave of emo, if you will, before emo was about haircuts. <laughs> and uh, Haircuts and tattoos. Yeah. yeah. And they had booked, they would book shows further out than in, in different locations than my band Supergrub was doing so every other weekend we were jumping in the van and going to these places and and this is kind of interesting the the scene that they were embraced by before I was in the band was the like uber left wing vegan like Hyper PC, mm-hmm. but like a really narrow lane of political correctness for just a very specific individual yeah. political <laughs> correctness, uh-huh. and 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 kids. I mean, being like a teenager, you get your first whiff of like self righteousness and PC, and some people go all the way off with that, and yeah. you know, like, Mom, how dare you cook chicken for dinner? <laughs> yeah. You're disrespecting my rights. And and these were the kids that were uh-huh. filling the um, filling the places we were playing, yeah. and the bands that we were playing with. And most of these people, most of the kids in those bands were not black. Mm-hmm. Most of the kids in those bands were not from low income families. Uh, I even think a lot of those kids from from those bands, other bands, and in that scene, a lot of them probably 
the parents probably weren't even, even divorced. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know what their experience was and I don't want to be a person to say right. they're this or they're that, but the vibe that I caught was not the vibe I was used to. It's and like basically there was really nothing wrong with their life. They were just creating all these problems just to have this selective On one hand, on the know. other hand though, being a teenager and, and starting to catch a glimpse of the world you're about to inherit is... Mm -hmm a fucking nightmare under any <laughs> yeah. circumstances. I mean, any decade, you start to see how the adults run shit and then all the stuff that you were taught about be nice and treat people kind, mm -hmm. you see the disconnect from that and then you have to reconcile that within yourself while, like, having 15 boners a minute and, like, acne. <laughs> it's not uh, it's not a good time for yeah. anybody. But, um, but they definitely came from a different yeah. set of, you know... A different, a different bag of struggle, and I do remember there being different times where we would go with the intention of borrowing speaker cabinets or amps or stuff. We would do that. Everybody would do that. That was the, that was how things went. So you jump in a van, you use somebody's stuff there, and there were definitely times where it was like, oh, he, he said you can't borrow his stuff. Hmm. Like really, like some kid from some other band, everybody was playing on his guitar amp all day long. Yeah, he's like, you can't borrow that. Oh, sweet. Huh. Cool. Yeah. You know, and it, I don't know. Luckily, yeah. I was. Luckily, I am pretty arrogant. I was going to say he was pretty arrogant, but I've, I've had a streak <laughs> of arrogance where deep down inside, I just I'm like, okay, this is my time on this planet. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, be an asshole. Yeah. You know, like, go ahead, knock yourself out with it. Eventually, if it's important to me, I'll figure out a way to do it. If it's important enough, I'll figure out how to do it right now. You know, I don't want to stop for somebody else. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I've got a couple more, just a couple more, um, and we'll let you, let you get a nap in. Um, so we were talking about being, you know, being black in the rock industry, and even life in general, you know, like, what it meant when you were just starting in those adverse times, you know, having having to struggle through, walking through that door, you know, kids not wanting you to play your, you know, their gear just because oh, um, just, you know for whatever reason that they don't want to say speak out loud, you know what, did, so does it mean something different today than it did then, like today in Trump's America and the way that we're dealing with this backlash like I said you know, Trump is America's reaction to having its first black president. Do allergic you, reaction? <laughs> yeah, it's an alert, yeah, exactly. Um, do you do you feel like? Do you express in the name of blackness any further? Do you feel like you know, like you know, and I I I, I struggled on that hill. You know, next motherfucker that says something ridiculous to me is getting knocked the fuck out. You know, I I <laughs> well, I definitely. I try to uh, I try not to make decisions from my anger mm -hmm. I, I always tr I try it that's really hard mm -hmm. but, but I start there and I think that everything that I do uh, to outsiders Every 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 aesthetic decision, every every little choice that I make, every moral decision, all of the things that I do will uh, represent blackness yeah. to outside people, mm -hmm. um, and that's just that's how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. So. When I, I try to keep that in mind and still make all the decisions that I want to make and be try to be the best version of myself, of how I was taught to treat people and and, and the, the morals that I learned growing up. And um, I, I'm aware of that. Like, you know, everyone's going to look at you as like, that's a black guy doing that. Not everyone, but everyone right. can. Yeah. Everyone can make the choice to be like, oh, so that's what blackness is or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, I don't look at that as a, as a burden. I look at that as a, 
as like a really a huge responsibility and a huge opportunity mm-hmm. and it's it's almost a gift I about six or seven years ago I was just in my head and I was thinking you know is this the life that I want to live like is it's if, if I could go back to the beginning I, I watched uh, the Bill Withers still Bill and he talked about you don't choose to get when you when you're being made as a person you don't get in the line be like stuttering oh, I'll sign up for that that sounds good <laughs> yeah yeah and after, and that started a whole existential spiral in my head of like well what would I choose mm-hmm. I'm getting older and I think I have a little bit of an identity now for myself to kind of assess myself and I thought to myself would I want this mm-hmm. and across like everything from being bald to being black to being a guy to have lived in the, the 80s and 90s to everything about me. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I would choose almost all of these things because it, I don't really want the easy path or what seems to be the easy path or what is the easy path. I would want things to be a little bit more of a challenge and I want them to be a little more complicated. And I'm not the darkest skinned guy, so I don't get the full blast of what that feels like in America or the world. Uh, so I, I do get a break and a little relief. Um, but th- there is there is always a challenge of that where people will look at you and say, well, you're just still different. Yeah. Different enough. And I, I, I embrace that. And, I'm, and I say, okay, well, I'm going to represent what that is, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing about me that I feel attempts to be stereotypical in any way because I don't, I don't want to be like anybody. I want to be like me. Yeah. And I want to, I want to have the skin that I have. I want to have all the things that I have, and I want to, I want to do this life with that. I don't know if that really answers the question, but absolutely does. Absolutely. I, what I'm picking up is too that it's there's a fine line between standing up for who you are, what you know, and what you want. And then that line between, you know, giving some fool ammunition to say, that's what black people are like. It's like, you know, that's what this black guy's like, you know. But I may be angry at this moment, but you can't base no. what I just said, which, especially if you don't speak carefully. And, and there is no, like, black people are not like anything. Right. Black people are, are human beings. Black people are like people. Mm-hmm. Black people want their families to be safe. They want food. They want to know that things are going to be okay. That's is that really unreasonable? And that's really the only the the only things that really connect black people as a whole. I've met black people with every type of personality, every type of ambition every every type of preference you could imagine and to me they all are they all are black people they all represent black people um there is no like well most of them are like this guy mm-hmm. because he's the one i see the most often it's, it's a bunch of bullshit yeah, yeah. There, i i don't i don't look at at groups of people like that mm-hmm. out of experience you know getting to know somebody helps but uh, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, I, I, everybody, everybody with this skin represents black people, yeah. you know. And you're you're an idiot if you don't take it as a case by case thing. In my book, you're you're an asshole, and you're missing out on all the beautiful things that black people are and do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one one last question: What do you tell that kid that you see? You know, wearing your Incubus shirt at the festival, mm-hmm. and he's like, "I play guitar, I play drums." You know, what do you tell him? Do you warn him? Do you say, "Go get him, take him prisoners"? What do you tell the kid? Her. I, I usually don't. I usually don't try to say anything because there's so many things about a, a an individual that will either help them get through these things so many internal things about them we either enable them to get through that process or they won't be able to get through that process and 
me, with my ego and everything, growing up as a kid, everything that bad that was going to happen to me, somebody had said, you know, watch out, watch out for rattlesnakes, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> right, yeah. every single possible thing. And every time somebody told me, I was just like, yep. yeah, that ain't going to happen to me. Yeah. You know, like whatever. <laughs> and, around that corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and it all happened. And then I realized that, you know, for me, I had to take those things on the head and in order to be able to appreciate that advice. So I don't really, I don't give any ad advice or anything like that. I just try to conduct myself in a way mm -hmm. that makes it so that if anything, I'm, what I do is a possibility, is an avenue. Uh, the choices that are visible that I make, they're, they're an option. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a painful option. Although it's not, I mean, music in general, and being a black musician, all these things put together, is not like the smoothest ride. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really not, uh, it's not by any means impossible. stuff don't waste your brush strokes that's all I was thinking yeah. I didn't really have anything to tell them other than just like let me just yeah. exist for you let me just sit in front of you and like whatever you want man you know you got you want to talk to me you want to kick it with me whatever let's hang I'm you know if you want this this is this is very attainable yeah you're living that example yeah yeah on, on, the, on the good days yeah <laughs> <laughs> we have our rainy days yeah yeah what's that phrase sun doesn't shine Wait, the sun shines on the dog's ass every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that. Yeah. Ben, I really, really thank you, man. Thank I really you. appreciate your time. I hope some of it I can ramble. No, no, no. That was great stuff. Beautiful. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was really yeah. nice. Thanks. Very little on the cutting room floor for sure. Near my word, okay. and Maybe somebody will double check their the shot. Should you, 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 you see that you know, when we it's like, frame or something happens? He's like, oh, well, you can't let that you know good. make you feel no, bad. No, like, no, like no, I don't. Maybe you exactly. can't let that make, make you, you feel can't. bad. Yeah, the, yeah. And the, the however many times it happened to you. Yeah. I, I, it just, I mean, each each little chirp grates on you just a just a bit. It's like, yeah, it's is that it's, necessary. <laughs> it's the uh, the oppressive environment. It just keeps going and going and going. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ever get let up to uh, let, if you don't have a chance to breathe, then you're going to drown. Yeah. Um, yep. It, it's it's like a war of attrition that you're you're set to lose. Yeah. And uh, you can't explain that to somebody. Like, right. It, it's it's that, that transcends just even race culture to like sports culture like mm -hmm. I, I uh, one of the few sports that I, I actually enjoy and pay attention to is is, uh, is fighting and, and, and mm -hmm. mixed martial arts and it it never ceases to surprise me how these athletes who are exponentially better than anyone that we know mm -hmm. at this specific task will go up against another athlete that is on this level that none of us have any idea of what it takes yeah. and they'll say oh well, this guy sucks because he, he yeah. it's like <laughs> yeah maybe in some maybe from the couch yeah right but, and, and people do that in music as well too where um, yeah. if, if you're not the greatest then you're, you're the worst yeah. across the board